uh, welcome back to the afternoon session, which is uh, 3A, Methodical Guides for Using Mobile Phone Data for Official Statistics, uh, the United uh, Nations Committee of Experts on Big Data and Data Science. So uh, this uh, session going to talk about exactly uh, the guidances what uh, this group has been working on for quite a while. As Matthias pointed out, there is a need for harmonized data and methodology. And from the point of view of methodology, this group has been working uh, to produce these guides. And uh, that actually, the story started earlier because uh, this was one of the first groups who worked on uh, uh, methodological guides to use uh, mobile phone data. And that guide is available, actually, our website. We're going to have to make reference to it, and you can check it. And that gives a general uh, overview about data sources, uh, the use of uh, uh, mobile data, the methodology used, the, uh, uh, the quality element used, and about the publication of uh, this kind of data. Meanwhile, this publication is already ready. We, two years ago, recognized that uh, some further guidance is needed to be worked on. And uh, today, we're going to present the work of uh, five subgroups working on, uh, let's see, dynamic population, tourism, uh, migration, uh, disaster statistics, and also on uh, information society statistics. So we are happy to present this to you, and I would like to invite you to uh, present, uh, to visit uh, our website, where these uh, guides will be available shortly, uh, because we are still finalizing them, but uh, we're going to publish them uh, very shortly. And why did we suggest this uh, session today? Not just because uh, Matthias said, uh, that uh, you need uh, guidance there, but we would like to, to connect to you. So we try to collect the uh, information from all the parties, but Mobile Tartu is gathering uh, scientists uh, who are working in this field, so I would like to, to offer you these details, and at the end we're going to have some time to discuss, and I would like to invite you to comment uh, whether you think our work stream is, uh, is relevant to your research or what suggestions would you have to us. So with, uh, send, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Karu Kovacs, and I'm working at the United Nations Statistics Division. And uh, I was working with uh, this group from the beginning, actually. And uh, it was really a very uh, good uh, working relation. So today, we're going to the first presentation will be by the dynamic population mapping with mobile phone data. And that will be presented by my dear colleague from Posisium, Sim Esco. And after that, we're going to have a, a presentation on the use of MPD for uh, tourism statistics. And we'll be presented uh, by Sarpono from uh, BPS uh, Statistics Indonesia. And the presentation after will be about the use of uh, mobile phone data for migration statistics, and will be presented by Shorena uh, uh, Tsakluri uh, from uh, Geostat, uh, Georgia. And uh, the next presentation will be about the uh, MPD uh, data used for uh, disaster and displacement statistics. And the last one uh, uh, will be about uh, the informi information society statistics. And uh, we'll have a video recording of that message done by Esperanza Makpantai uh, from ITU. And uh, you see also in the program that much more names are, are listed there, because uh, this is a work uh, of uh, of uh, five SAP groups, so a lot of contributors to, to this work. So without further ado, I would like to invite Sim to make the presentation on uh, the dynamic population. Thank you, Karai. 
so if you want to find the website of the UN, UN Committee of Experts on Big Data and Data Science for Official Statistics, just Google that uh, very long name and you will find it. Or, or if you put in uh, UN and uh, UN Statistics and Big Data, you will find it as well. Um, I will talk about the first guidance document, uh, which is mobile phone data for dynamic population mapping. Uh, you already heard uh, some of this uh, from previous sessions. And uh, the objective of, the, of this guidance document is not to uh, provide something new, but to uh, incorporate existing knowledge that has been generated in the research area and also uh, in uh, existing and successful projects that have been done uh, in, this, in this field. So um, I'm presenting um, this paper, uh, this guidance document, but I stand on the shoulders of giants, which are listed uh, on, the, on the bottom here, who are all authors of this uh, guidance document. And um, so why we talk about population, uh, we, we have done the census uh, for m since the Roman period, and uh, we, we kind of... Um, had a grasp of uh, how many people are in uh, certain locations for a long time. And for example, um, Vienna's population data goes back to the Middle Ages, uh, after the Dark Ages. Uh, but now, with the, with the people so mobile, do we actually know how many people are in our city? But the decision makers, they need to know that. The development needs faster decision making, they need uh, faster data, and they need this data faster and in greater detail than they uh, needed it before to make decisions on, on uh, utilities, transportation, uh, even where to, uh, how to defend um, people from uh, various diseases. And uh, it's so, so much related also to the Sustainable Development Goals. Population is the underpinning of uh, many of the statistics that we produce. But there are challenges to the current population methods, and I know there are benefits as well. Uh, so I will not uh, stop there, but uh, focus on more on the challenges of the methods that we use right now for population, which is um, uh, high cost of the census, which is the you, you would you would imagine the perfect uh, way to measure population in a certain time and place, but then it's only that time and place, and uh, it doesn't translate to uh, always, always translate to how, what is happening during the day and uh, during the night in a certain certain location. Um, there there are other uh, under and over coverage issue, issues with registries, for example, and timeliness timeliness issues. So even if you have a good quality uh, system of registries, which is, um, which is the, the basic, basic of it, then you still uh, run the risk of uh, not knowing the dynamic nature uh, of the population uh, in your city. I think this was uh, well addressed also in the, in the session in the morning from Sweden. And dynamic population mapping through mobile phone data aims to answer uh, how to map population dynamically, so without being uh, dependent on the log logistics of these large-scale surveys, uh, which are sometimes a hindrance to doing population statistics, in, uh, at, especially in developing countries, but also during COVID times we've seen that. And how to map a dynamically behaving population, how how the population changes over time, how it changes over hours uh, even. Uh, even what people are doing away from the place of residence. So the def definitions that we use are um, quite similar to official statistics. There's the Euro population, there's de facto population. And with the Euro population, we are actually in a good place for those uh, countries that have access to good registries and, uh, and census has uh, just been conducted. So uh, we can live on that, but it's the de facto and dynamic nature of population uh, which measures the presence of people in different areas, uh, which is something that opens up a new, a whole new field. And uh, that's why this, uh, this definition is, um, you know, on the one hand, it's quite well defined, uh, measuring the presence, but then on the other hand, uh, what are the data sources that you can use uh, to, to measure that according to that definition? And uh, 
there are eight different ways mobile data can be used for population, starting from just measuring the residents, uh, just measuring the, the Euro population, and then going to daytime population, so where people are spending their work hours, uh, and then going even further from there uh, to measure de facto population, where they're spending every hour of the day or uh, how the population changes uh, from day to day in different, uh, different areas and what is the composition of that population. Then using that, uh, using that data to understand how population has, has been redistributed, uh, maybe through some adverse effects like the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, infrastructure and resource planning that takes into account the dynamic nature of, uh, of population, especially, uh, for example, those areas that have a high, uh, high degree of uh, secondary homes where people are not present uh, every day, uh, or or even in, um, in places like uh, Tartu, where many people uh, leave, for, leave for the summer and, and tourists, uh, tourists actually come. So um, going, going all the way to the census and how to use uh, this same data set for, uh, for preparing, planning, and also doing the intercensal estimates, all of these cases uh, are in the methodological guidance document, uh, which will be published uh, later in the year. So uh, they are discussed in at least to some point and referenced in uh, existing research. But methodological challenges. Yes, we love a good challenge, especially if it comes to methodology. And uh, the uh, guidance document also poses questions that should be answered and maybe some ways to overcome them as it has been identified in, in research. How do you build a data model in the right way that uh, uh, this actually uh, fits the official uh, definitions and it can be used over time in a consistent way? How to detect, um, how to make the definitions of uh, detecting place of residence and uh, selecting the right home detection algorithm? Uh, which has been, uh, this is one of the issues that has been thoroughly researched. Then how to ensure data coverage and uh, representativity and overcoming the selectivity biases in the data, especially if you're using a sample. Uh, and how to model this population density when you're dealing with, uh, with cell site level information. Then taking it all together, how do you validate these results? Uh, is it comparison to the official data that you have, um, should you take into account uh, different definitions and how you, how you measure things. And uh, some, some ways to overcome them, a choice of model. Um, it's, it's quite common, uh, and uh, if you don't mind me saying so, also in research to build a model for the research question you're trying to answer. And this is uh, what we call a simplified model, where you take the raw data and you're acquiring something from that raw data. And it can be a quick indicator and, uh, uh, and it could give you a rough estimate, at least to some degree, uh, but it's not suitable for official statistics. Um, and um, then on the other side, we have a general model where you model uh, a reality for each subscriber separately and you're uh, building a data model that m matches official uh, definitions and statistical concepts, how to apply the statistical concepts, they are only applied in the late uh, stage in data processing after you have, you have cleaned the data and modeled the data uh, to almost uh, perfection, as, as, as close to reality as possible. And this kind of uh, model is most useful for official statistics because then you can use uh, the same model for different kinds of uh, statistics and they are consistent across the board. Second question, um, how to select the place of residence? As I said, there are many, ma many research has been done in this regard, but uh, some of that uh, research is uh, misleading. It leads to the wrong, uh, wrong methods, perhaps, because um, uh, according to research that was actually presented in Mobile Tartu in 2018, so uh, this uh, special mention to Mobile Tartu for contributing to this uh, field, the 
choice of criteria actually has a huge influence on the quality of the results. So up to 40% of the population might be displaced according to the home detection criteria that you use, whether you use nighttime location or a, a more, uh, a more, um, uh, more complicated model. And then, okay, so how do you define which kind of home detection is most suitable? Then you have to have a way of validating this. And I think this is where uh, researchers can uh, really, really do a lot uh, to take existing definitions and start validating them, either through uh, aggregate comparison, ha it has, as has been done here in a, in a, in a, for now, quite an old study by Deville et al. in, in Portugal on aggregate uh, census data and mobile phone data and with good, quite good results, or uh, through validation panels, as had be, has been done by uh, Statistics Estonia, University of Tartu and Positium, uh, to understand if the homes that were determined algorithmically and those that were actually mentioned by the people as, as their home, and also with the, with the registry information, if they match one-to-one uh, -one and you, you have opt-in panels that give access to all of these data sets and then you can cross-validate. So this, um, this would be perfect, but the panels, of course, they are, they are smaller. You cannot cover the entire country. Um, but again, uh, some methods provide very, very good uh, results on, a, on the count level and even on the polygon level. And uh, so... I leave uh, these research questions uh, to you, uh, to you researchers, um, to some things to think about how to expedite the prog uh, progress because a lot of research has been done and we wouldn't uh, devise a guidance document if uh, this domain was not ready for, uh, for use in official statistics already. But um, uh, of course there is a lot of research to, to be done to and uh, to make it to link it to existing statistical processes uh, to take care of these representative uh, nest issues and um, and like has been done by uh, colleagues at the University of Helsinki, making dynamic population data sets available to develop more use cases out of them and uh, create more awareness and please validate 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 thank you, thank you for your cooperation. Thank you very much, Sim. And we're going to have to follow the same uh, pattern as uh, the previous session. So please hold on your questions. We're going to have to have the question ans answer session at the end. So I would like to ask uh, Sarpono to, to make the presentation, please. Thank you very much, uh, Karoli. Uh, good day, everybody. <clears throat> uh, as we know, that tourism is an important economic sector. Uh, for many countries uh, around the world, as well as a major source according to the <clears throat> foreign revenue, helping to create job, promote entrepreneurship, and develop local economy. And this time, I'm Sarpono from BPS Indonesia, and also my colleagues Ibu Titi there will be present according to the mobile phone data for official statistics. Uh, in the use of mobile phone data, uh, in the tourism statistic as a complement for other data sources and also a replacement for other data sources. For example, with experience in my country, complement for immigration data, especially for administrative data, and then complement inbound tourism when there is no immigration checkpoint destination analysis, and also outbound tourism to obtain country of destination and length of stay in each country. And also the use of mobile phone data in tourism statistics, it can a replacement for other data sources, for example, uh, for domestic tourism, replacement of household survey, usually conducted in my country. And also inbound tourism, replacement of subtle trade cross border survey, and also event analysis, replacement of survey and ticket sales. And then according to the this diagram, 
for this diagram given the schematic il illustration of concept in tourism statistic by UNWTO. From this diagram, we can define tourism and other concept and definition according to the tourism. In order to identify uh, useful environment of tourism in MPD, National Statistical Office could refer to international recommendation, uh, tourism 2018, and feasibility study of the MPD for tourism statistics, especially for uh, point three A, meteorological issue published by Eurostat. Based on anchor of meaningful location in this uh, schematic, uh, we can identify for a specific period, period of time, especially in Indonesia, uh, we use one year period to determine the usual environment. And then based on this diagram of usual environment model and home uh, detection algorithm, we can identify outside usual environment as a uh, tourism homework, round trip regularly, and also as commute or changing home over a year as an international uh, migration. Uh, from the handbook on the use of mobile phone data for official statistics published by UNSD recommended NSO to use probing and signaling of CDR. Some notes according to the signaling are capture more data. Uh, there is a very big, especially for domestic, domestic tourism, and also good for tourism statistics and commuting and noises uh, in statistic and non-statistical point of view. Well, uh, for CDR, uh, less uh, data and possible under coverage, especially for inbound and outbound. And also we can combine both uh, signaling and probing. And according to the <coughs> uh, data access, there is uh, some uh, main challenge when using MPDS data source for official statistics. Given the challenge with assessing raw data from MNO, it is important to apply the same methodology and also approaches across MNO. When NSO have full access uh, to raw data, the control on the quality and methodology of the statistic, like those for other data source, uh, I think uh, very important. There are some types for MPD access, for example, Estonia by statistical law and Georgia by telco regulator and uh, also in Indonesia, we have um, OU and contract. And then for the next slide, existence of statistic and non-statistical noises of probing and signaling data of inbound roaming data that are created by special types of roaming such as uh, for flyer, uh, fast flyer, semen, also accidental rumor. This is a usual situation in many countries. Uh, network coverage of antenna near country border can extend to make boring countries accidentally use a roaming service can occur. There are, uh, therefore, methodology is important to filtering method or detecting and removing noises to ensure representativeness and quality of data select. Uh, there is a data and indicator obtained from MPD. For example, uh, uh, in my country, we already implement inbound tourism, outbound tourism, domestic tourism, respectively for number of tourism, length of stay, please visit it, and also even analysis to get number of visitors, uh, and please visit it can be obtained by, by MPD. Another indicator, uh, obtained from MPD for SDGs. For example, the first uh, demand site data for a tourism satellite account. And so uh, tourism has the potential to contribute directly and indirectly or uh, to all SDGs as uh, has been explicit, explicitly mentioned at our jet goal in number eight and number 12. For example, SDG number uh, 12, tourism direct uh, GDB as a proportion of total GDB. 
and also MPD gave better coverage than household survey, better than with supply uh, side in TSA framework. Also linking TSA and system, uh, environmental and economic account, SEEA, to obtain SDGs goal number 12. And the next slide, there is uh, some, uh, there are some uh, three components according to the data source can be used on in official statistic. The first one is quality assurance, sound methodology, and issue privacy preferencing uh, processing. For the first one, quality assurance is important to produce uh, uh, at, I mean uh, official statistic to gain, tra uh, to gain trust from data user and public. Systematic approach to quality assurance is the best way. This means that all aspects of MPD should be examined and evaluated with certain principles and standards in order to assure the quality and accuracy of the tourism statistics they are produced from MPD. Also, uh, quality assurance in line with uh, UN QEF dimension, for example, for relevant accuracy, reliability, coherence, timeliness, and also uh, accessibility. And also uh, refer to big data quality. Uh, in order to fit for its purpose as official statistic and trust by public or data user, MPD need to pass all the gates like other data source, for example, census, survey, and administrative data. Related to uh, quality assurance can refer, uh, for example, in this case, BPS Quality Assurance Framework Handbook, with uh, uh, also UN Quality Assurance Framework. And there are three quality gates in data input, throughput, or uh, output. For the first gate, input quality checking, for example, uh, input quality checking consists of uh, data gap, missing data, incorrect time, stamp, and duplicate record. In the second gate, throughput quality checking consists of error in data processing or, and overwrites. And the third gate, output quality checking consists of anomaly checking coherent with others' data. And then uh, for uh, the issue of privacy, surveillance, and fundamental rights are important aspects of mobile positioning. Any uh, study conducted with the use of MPD must ensure the personal privacy, uh, avoid discrimination, and respect funda fundamental rights, as the data may contain sensitive information. To keep e confidentiality, mobile operator can aggregate anonymous geographical data from log files, such as location point or movement factor. And data user can use uh, this for scientific purposes or for planning. An example for, uh, of the, this personalization approach is making subscriber contact with number with has. And the last slide, there is uh, some challenge according to uh, implemented mobile phone data in tourism statistic. The first one is data access uh, if there is no direct rule of regulation. And the second challenge, uh, administrative and legal process, administrative, um, we must review contract and negotiation, etc. Once of the uh, MNO have committed keeping that commitment and also MNO uh, staff, data scientists, lack understanding of statistics. And the last, data processing volume, in my experience in Indonesia, up to 144 uh, terabyte data per year. Uh, that's all my presentation, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you, Sarpono. So, he hinted quite a few challenges, quite a few questions to, to reflect to, so that will come at the end. So I would like to, to call my colleague to talk about the uh, migration statistics. Sorena, the uh, floor is yours. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, thank you so much for the possibilities to be here and present the methodological guidance on the use of MPT for official statistics for migration statistics. My name is Shorena and I'm from Georgia. I'm head of Population Census and Demographic Statistics Office, uh, Demographic Statistics Department at Geostat. I would like to mention that this handbook on migration statistics has been prepared by the MPD task team, uh, led by our team, by, led by Geostat, with very huge support from Positive, EUGRs, and UNSD. Oh, sorry, I forgot to change. Uh, and also, uh, we are very thankful with uh, professors of uh, James Reimer and Maria Isabel from the UNSD, their uh, recommendations and their inputs. Uh, the aim of our handbook on migration statistics is uh, uh, to uh, give some uh, ideas and opportunities for the statistical data users and uh, producers of statistics uh, how to use the methodology to apply MPD to uh, produce data for migration statistics as well as uh, we are discussing about the concepts and definitions about the data sources, uh, some algorithms uh, and also uh, for statisticians it's very important important data quality and this handbook also is discussed about the data quality issues. It is well known that migration, it is not easy process uh, to measure. It can be classified by several factors, by directions, by you know, crossing of the border, internal and international migration, purpose of the migration, uh, duration of stay in and out of the country, etc. So the common definition is very useful and for the internal migration I would like to mention that it's a virus across the country and it is mainly depends on the data sources uh, and uh, uh, definition of the usual residents. And according to the international recommendation which we are using for population census, it is a uh, person's country of usual residence is that in which person lives. So for this, we are using 12 months criteria. But since we are talking about the uh, MPD to assess the migration, uh, the notion of the usual resistance when, uh, is often associated with 50% uh, plus one principle. So, so it means that uh, based on the MPD, non Romer data as a starting point, it is possible to observe the person during the 12 months or more and consider him her as a usual residence of the municipality or the, or, of the, or the region where more than 50% of communications, I mean the incoming and going calls or SMS internet connections, etc., have been tracked in the first half of the uh, 12 months period and same person we can consider as an internal migrant if he or she uh, spends a uh, same situation uh, in the second half of the observation period. But this is criteria might be easy now for where we are talking about the traditional data sources. But when we are talking about the MPTs, this criteria is not enough for, for identifying the migrants. We need to account the number of connections, communications, of course, but it is also essential to specify the time also. So, uh, for this, we must to think and we must to distinguish daytime and nighttime pop uh, population as uh, it was presented in the previous session by our colleagues from Swedish stati uh, Sweden Statistics. Uh, regarding the international migration, I could say that international migration on these handbooks is in line with new standards of the definitions, uh, which is was the endorsed by a 52nd session of the UN Statistical Commission just last year in March. 
So uh, from the point of view MPD, the connect of migration can be defined as the international mobility of the subscribers, not uh, population. And we will need several steps to identify international migrants. We can, uh, for this and for the statistical purpose, we can apply six months criteria. So, uh, about the data sources, it is well known that traditional data sources like population censuses and population registers consider as a solid source for producing official migration statistics. But they have their limitations. Today, in the modern society, we need more accurately and more timely data. Population census is a good source, but it's conduct each 10 years. And it is also very difficult to capture all immigrants. So if all family, for example, left the country, we don't have anyone to just uh, give us information how many persons left the country. Another limitation as I mentioned, it is in each 10 or 5 years, so uh, census is not a good solution. Also, population registers, even, even if population register is well developed, it has its limitations. So, uh, it, is, it is always challenging a registered population and usual residence population. So many countries are using border crossing data for produce uh, flow, migration flows, but this data is quantitative rather than qualitative approach. I mean that it can give us idea how many immigrants and immigrants we have, but we cannot distinguish the migrants by purpose of migration, etc. So it seems that big data and especially mobile phone data is good solution to solve, the, uh, solve this problem. So it has its advantages like timeliness, access to statistical information. So what I would like to mention is that uh, we, in my country at least, in Georgia, we are considered to reply the tra traditional data sources by big data, but it is more complementary sources. So we will be able to produce statistics which we don't have now in the census period, as well as we will have more variables and uh, more solutions. Uh, but when we are talking about the advantages, we don't have to forget about the limitations, which has the big data also. Uh, very important is to think about the quality of the socio-demographic indicators which has the mobile phone operators. Another possible limitation can, uh, can be completeness and accuracy of the data, as it uh, mainly depends on the type of devices. It is crucial to obtain data from all the mobile operators to have idea if person, for example, change their phone numbers and still keeps the devices, we can track this person. And uh, also, Geographic accuracy, so called the costing, is very important. And uh, uh, I can say that uh, also one of the big uh, limitations uh, can be uh, can be uh, coping with uh, the coverage. So. When we are talking uh, about the official statistics on migration and we are going to use the MPD as the official statistics, we must, to, uh, we must to think about some uh, technical and legal aspects, which is very important. And for example, we faced in our countries these limitations. So data privacy law uh, varies across the country. So 
we must think in advance about the legal aspects, as well as the IT structure is very important factor to produce using MPT for migration statistics, and as well as data access, because sometimes it is not easy for statistical offices to obtain this data, because due to some regulations, some rules, etc., or some, uh, some uh, I don't know, privacy reasons. So it is, so uh, think, my last slide. I'm happy to answer your comments. Thank you so much. I would like just mention that in Georgia, we have pilot project with UN. Uh, First, uh, first step of our project was to develop methodology, and next step is to assess our methodology on our Georgian data, and we are working very hard to have some results uh, in the nearest future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shorena. So again, you got, uh, your list is increasing. Uh, the time is uh, not, uh, will, will not be uh, very long, but still please uh, uh, make your notes on, on the questions. So the next presentation will be on the displacement and dis disaster statistics by uh, Ayumi. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Karin. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I'm Mayumi Arai with the University of Tokyo. I am presenting this uh, presentation uh, on behalf of the subgroup, which consists of a lot of institutions, uh, starting from Flowminder, India School of Business, IOM, ITU, Positium, Palace of Jakarta, Telenor Research, University of Tokyo as a lead, and UNSC and World Bank. Let me start with the definition. So what are displacement disaster statistics? So when we say disaster, it's a disruptive event, not only climate uh, related, but also the health hazard. And in this, in this guide, we discuss a statistic, particularly population affected by disastrous event. So uh, what is a statistical framework in disaster context? Okay, context. So statistics on population affected by disaster are, the, are usually uh, direct deaths, injured, and disaster affected in general in many um, way. And it is one of the it is said that it is one of the most challenging to define and measure. But at the same time, now the international communities are working on the establishment of formal mechanism to advance a statistical framework. To, on disaster-related statistics. So we currently, we don't have a specific uh, framework, international framework or standard, but uh, we, our community are working on it. Okay. So there are increasing policy demand in measuring the hazardous event on affected population, and timely and quality information is crucial for disaster risk reduction and also response effort. And also the National Statistical Office are playing crucial role in responding to such data demand. Okay. And also there are high level policy framework for addressing such data demands, such so for example, Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, uh, 2030 agenda for sustainable development and the Paris Agreement. And these are closely related to sustainable development goals, particularly goal three and 11. So you can see that the statistics are related to affected population under disaster are increasingly important for the society. Okay. So what are the advantage of mobile phone data in disaster context? So previous presentations already explained well about the general uh, advantage for many statistics. I, so I focus on the uh, usefulness in disaster context. So firstly, the data can trace large population at the various scale of time and space, uh, particularly in, under the disaster context. It's really important that the data can uh, cover very large population at once. And secondly, the data can capture quickly evolving, evolving situation in timely manner. So the data is very frequent and also the granular. 
So compared to the uh, conventional statistics, which require survey and coordination, uh, it can be uh, quite responsible in uh, providing uh, timely statistics. And thirdly, uh, once the data access is granted, uh, less logistical constraints are for data collection is necessary. So for example, in the COVID or in disaster where the conducting survey for data collection is difficult, uh, mobile phone data is one of the useful resources for uh, getting the information from the ground. Okay. So here I would like to explain the overview of the guide. So in this uh, methodological guide, we provide uh, uh, steps for responding the data demand through use cases where we highlighted the importance of uh, institutional framework and data pipeline, uh, which is a kind of uh, in infrastructure for process, process, uh, uh, processing the data, uh, and also the uh, methodology for producing statistics. So in this handbook, we particularly in, uh, in highlight the importance of institutional framework and also data pipeline because it facilitates timely response and also the enhance the preparedness and the ref ref response capacity. So for, as an in institutional framework, we need to establish partnership and also secure data access while discussing policy relevance for using mobile phone data because the nature of the data is very confidential. There is a certain agreement on the use of data and also need to be a certain policy relevance for using the data. And once the data access is granted, we need a data pipeline to process the data. So we set up system in the data, uh, usually it's in the premise of data producer because the data usually cannot be uh, outside of the uh, data producer. And uh, particularly in disaster context, having such institutional framework and data pipeline is very significant because it, it, it facilitates a timely response. And once the data syst uh, system setup is done, a data protection measure will be also an important factor for processing mobile phone data. So it should be compiled with a legal framework and no individually identified information should be included when the, for the analysis, data used for the analysis. Then we did, uh, discuss data quality assurance, particularly for the disaster context. Uh, in addition to the general uh, data quality assurance, we need to examine the validity of data for the analytical purpose. For example, we, whether we can see the changes uh, which may most likely caused by the disaster. So we need the information before and after the disaster to understand how, what, the, what is the impact or effect caused by disaster. And for statistical data production, uh, particularly for disaster, we introduce a displacement or a relocation statistics and also changes the mobility. And uh, lastly, a results of dissemination as a data sharing between the data producer and end user. Here, I like to introduce two use cases I introduced in our handbook. One is a case study from uh, Flowminder uh, about high Haiti, use, Haiti earthquake use case in 2021. So they have a long-standing uh, relationship between Flowminder and Digital Haiti, which is one of MNO for previous disastrous event. So when disaster happen, they can quickly uh, produce mobility aggregates uh, using the pre-existing data pipeline and also using FlowKit. Uh, and also the data, with that system, the data were anonymized and aggregated and the, method they, the methodology they employ are compiled with the EU GDPR and of course the data process in the digital Haiti premise. Okay. This is one of the examples they produce as a displacement disaster statistics. It is a, the percentage of population relocated by community. So using the, statistic, uh, using the mobile phone data aggregate, they can indicate what is the changes in population count at the percentage of pre-earthquake pre period. This is a part of one, one example of statistics. And then I also want to introduce another other use case to measure impact mobility restriction due to COVID-19 in the Gambia. 
So there is, was also a pre-existing pre -existing partnership between the National Statistical Office uh, regulator and two MNO, World Bank and University of Tokyo for internal migration analysis, where World Bank and University of Tokyo are exist as an intermediary to support the communication uh, and fac facilitate the communication between data producer and data user. And we brought in the regulator because in this study, we work with two MNO, so they are the one who process the data. So we use analytical pipeline to produce statistics, which is already there for other study uh, for international mi internal migration analysis, and code and system are already there. And the data was anonymized, and privacy preserving technique were reviewed by the, some, uh, by the RIGA framework, and the data was processed by the uh, regulator's premise. Uh, this is an example of the results showing the effect of people's mobility, uh, the this daily distance travel as they use a proxy to, uh, to uh, examine the people's mobility. So you can see that our, the mobility most affected are living in small villages compared to large city, and the small area are more likely uh, concentrated with the poor, so they may they have a discussion that uh, most affected could be a poor under the restriction uh, during the COVID. So this is the last slide as a discussion. So besides the methodology framework for computing statistics, uh, particularly in uh, disaster context, institutional framework and also the analytical pipeline infrastructure is very important for enhancing, enhancing preparedness and response capacity. And also this factor can accelerate the use of mobile phone data further after the event. And also the securing data access remains a challenge. And particularly in disaster context, other data set from private sector available. So if you, your country or region do not have access to this mobile phone data, this guide also recommend to try using the private sector data because it could be a good uh, proof of concept for further uh, effort using mobile phone data. And particularly in the developing country where the data is tend to be uh, sparse, uh, we still need some innovation in analytical method because uh, disaster in, under the disaster period, we have to uh, examine the impact relatively short term. So sparseness of data really affects the impact uh, outcome of the analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayumi. So this concludes the, uh, the physical presentations. And uh, uh, actually, oops, I'm stuck now, all right. So uh, actually, we're going to have a video uh, presentation of the last uh, uh, presentation will be about the uh, Information Society Handbook. Could you start the video, please? Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Esperanza Makpantai. I'm pleased to present to you the UN methodological guidance on the use of mobile phone big data for measuring the information society. I'll be focusing on the two SDG ICT indicators uh, that we are collecting in the International Telecommunication Union. Uh, the ITU is a UN specialized agency on telecommunication and information and communication technologies. And I work here as a senior statistician, but at the same time, I lead the UN CEBD task team on mobile phone big data. So I'm going to cover five key points covering the overview of the work that we do, some background uh, on the use of mobile phone big data for a project that we implemented here in ITU more details on the methodological guidance, as well as some key takeaways while using this data. So just as a background, the ITU has been regularly collecting and disseminating information and communication and ICT statistics, one of which is on the use of the internet uh, and on the mobile population coverage. So these two key statistics are used widely by the international community, researchers, and uh, academia, particularly highlighting where mobile phone networks are available 
And as you can see on the left chart, uh, almost 95% of the world population is covered by mobile population signal, particularly those of 3G. However, on the right, you will see that only around 60% of the population is using the internet. So there's still a huge gap in, with regards to mobile population coverage and the use of the internet. And these two key indicators are the ones that I'm going to focus on in my presentation. So the ITU has been passed by the UN SDG monitoring um, exercise, particularly on the framework that looks at the use of information and communication technologies. And these five key ICT indicators are collected and disseminated by the ITU. Two of those, uh, target 9C and target 17.8, are the ones that we um, tested and piloted in the ITU to see how we can use mobile phone big data to complement or supplement these two data sets that are particularly collected traditionally from household surveys or those coming from administrative records. The ITU has been piloting the use of mobile phone big data in between 2016 and 2018, and in the later part of 2020 and in 2021. The objective here indeed is to find out how the traditional data sources that we use to collect the data that we disseminate particularly those that are coming from household surveys and administrative data sources collected by ministries and regulators, how these two data sources could be complemented by data coming from uh, big data sources, particularly those of mobile phone big data. So in this exercise, we look at eight countries where we work with telecom regulators, ministries, and national statistical offices, as well as mobile network operators to see how the mobile phone big data could be used to calculate the two ICT indicators on mobile population coverage and use of the internet. These countries are um, dispersed around the world to see how this could be replicated in different country scenarios and country incomes. So the objective of this pilot is to indeed see how we can work on a methodological guide covering two indicators, the proportion of the population covered by mobile networks and proportion of individuals using the internet. And through this methodological guide, what we want to achieve is to enhance capacities in countries, particularly national statistical offices in the use of these new data sources. Data and reports coming from these pilots showcasing their uh, best practices and experiences were derived during this exercise. And finally, what we want to do is to disseminate this knowledge through the delivery of training courses and workshops in countries or in regions covered by the ITU and working closely with experts from the UN CEBD. So the stages of implementation. So these pilots were implemented using um, different partners, both um, governments, so the ministries and the national statistical offices, the regulators, as well as MNOs and uh, other partners such as Positium. In this work, we had to get commitments from national stakeholders because access to the data is something that is very time consuming and important in this exercise. And during kickoff meetings, we managed to put together different stakeholders where they are um, committing themselves with regards to their willingness to share the data and processing of the data. The analysis and evaluation of the results is very important because this is where we will be able to conclude whether mobile phone big data could indeed be used in the production of official statistics uh, that the ITU wants to pilot. So on the UN methodological guidance, particularly on measuring the information society. So this is a guide that we produce out of these several pilots, combining the different experiences gained from um, access to the data and how the data are processed and analyzed. We also highlight here the data sources that we use, particularly those that are coming from mobile network operators. 
the different um, important fields that are required and how the different um, quality assurance of raw data are implemented. We also talk about the reference data that is important when analyzing mobile phone big data. This includes, of course, the local administrative units in each of the countries that we piloted, and this can vary from one country to another. The world population data, which is coming from WorldPAP, um, the digital elevation data, and the household survey data, which is key to this exercise, because this is uh, the source of data that we use to verify the validity and the accuracy of the data coming from mobile phone sources. We also outlined the data processing methods, the, uh, the models that could be used by countries, as well as any data protection guidelines that needs to be exercised when uh, analyzing mobile phone network data. We are also outlining how the data on the two key SDG indicators can be calculated, why we need to calculate them, what are the definition that is relevant for those two indicators and how the data could be calculated, providing step-by-step um, -step guide with regards to the calculation and, and um, uh, consideration that needs to be taken when analyzing those data, as well as quality assurance of the calculated data. And finally, we provide guidelines with regards to the presentation of the results and some interesting highlights with regards to experiences of countries and conclusions that could be derived when analyzing this uh, mobile phone big data. And I would like to emphasize here one of the key uh, important components that is outlined in this guideline, which is the role of the different key stakeholders. And I outlined here the four key stakeholders. First is the telecom regulator or the line ministry, and they are very important because they are the ones that provide uh, licenses to the mobile network operators. They have uh, equipments and expertise that could be used to process and store the data. They frequently interact with the mobile network operators in the course of the regulatory net, uh, work. And they are in the position to negotiate and mediate with regards to access to the mobile network data. The National Statistics Office is a key stakeholder in the country because they are guided by statistical act that provides them the mandate to produce official statistics and collect the data in different areas of uh, the statistics that are mandated to them to collect. They also have the necessary skills and expertise that are needed to analyze statistical information. Of course, the third stakeholder is the mobile network operator and service providers. They are key because they are the custodian of this mobile phone big data. They have equipments and they've invested on equipments and expertise to store and analyze these records. And they have to also submit this data as an obligation on their licenses and franchise. And they have staff that have the big data skills to analyze mobile phone big data. In many countries, the Data Protection Agency, which is a very new agency, is important because they provide guidance with regards to the oversight on the use of uh, the data that's coming from mobile network operators. It ensures safeguards uh, with regards to ensuring privacy and anonymization of the data. So these are the four key stakeholders that's important to work with when accessing the data coming from mobile network operators. Another important component that is outlined in the guidance is the data processing models. There are two key data processing models that we emphasize when using mobile network data. One is centralized, this is where the mobile network operators pre-process the data and transfer them to the producer of statistics. It can be the ministry, the regulator, or the national statistics office who processes the data and derive the indicators that's needed for policy making. The second option is the distributed, where the mobile network operators pre-process the data and at the same time do the final data processing to derive the indicators that's needed by the National Statistics Office, the regulator, or the ministry. So these two processing options are implemented in the several pilots that we did in, in the ITU. 
So a question is, what is the importance of using mobile phone big data? And here I would like to emphasize that for the case of information society statistics, we were able to produce more timely and disaggregated ICT statistics using mobile phone network data and provide you with some results. Using traditional data sources, survey data are usually produced every two years in many countries and in some countries less frequent than that. So the mobile network of operator data provides more um, disaggregated and timely data. This is the result coming from um, Indonesia and Brazil. So the two pilots where we did uh, tested the use of mobile phone big data for percentage of population covered by mobile signal. And here in these two cases, you will see that data are provided in a more disaggregated level. And it also compares in Brazil, the data that was provided by uh, the regulator. And so you will see um, in both cases that more disaggregated data are available at uh, a more uh, granular level in the, in the country. At the same time, this is the percentage of population using the internet. This is an SDG key indicator, which is used widely by several international organizations as well. And here for the case of Indonesia and Brazil, um, the data that's coming from MPD, particularly in Brazil, has very a small difference with regards to the survey data. While in the case of Indonesia, although there's some differences, the pattern is similar. So one can conclude that mobile phone big data could be used to complement or supplement this data coming from household survey. This is again a more disaggregated data with regards to the use of technologies in Brazil and, and Indonesia. And in particular, you will see, for example, the right-hand side, which shows that in Brazil, more disaggregated data by technology can be uh, shown in, in the different mun municipalities. At the same time, uh, in Brazil and Indonesia, uh, dispersion of internet access with regards to mobile phone big data could be provided in different uh, sub-levels of municipalities or area in Bali. And finally, uh, key takeaway, how could the implementation of guidance, of the guidance be accelerated in developing countries? So I would say, based on the experiences that we highlighted and we implemented in several countries, there's always a need to prepare all the administrative and legal procedures to access the data. And this was highlighted in the guidance. It is important that we use the guidance to make sure that clear and unambiguous methodology is implemented across different uh, scenarios. Of course, with regards to the calculation, and algorithms to be employed in uh, using mobile phone big data. It's important that the necessary infrastructure and human resources are available in the country, in developing countries. This remains to be a challenge in many developing countries. And it's important that this is uh, put into consideration when considering this uh, use of mobile phone big data. Coordination is important with the different stakeholders. And I emphasize the key stakeholders that needs to be um, employed when uh, using this new data source. And finally, since mobile phone big data could be used in multiple areas of statistics, it's important to work with several stakeholders and establish data pipelines that could be used in different areas of uh, statistics that are required in, in developing countries. Thank you very much. Oh. So um, I would like to round it up. Uh, actually, that we have five uh, presentations because the five handbooks are ready. And we are planning to, to have these uh, uh, books ready for, uh, for use uh, before the commencement of the seventh international conference, uh, which will be held in November in, in Indonesia. And uh, shall also tell you that there is another book uh, which is in the pipeline, and that's referring also Matthias presentation in the morning about transportation statistics. We don't have much details yet because it's in 
in the works, but uh, we are planning to, to finish that uh, too. And here we shall stop because time is going on. So if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. There's a gentleman. Um, hello again, Mantas. Um, I would like to ask uh, maybe Sharena, uh, because uh, in your presentation you mentioned that uh, we should focus on getting all mobile network operators' data, not one, but all of them. And this corresponds with uh, the Fabio presentation in the morning. Uh, he also mentioned the same uh, conclusion. So um, I'm just trying to figure out which way is the better because in, uh, if to conclude all of your presentations, I would say that uh, all um, having all MNOs um, on board would guarantee some safety. Uh, because if one is uh, one is left, uh, others can still be used. Uh, but from other side, uh, like in Indonesia, it's uh, hundreds of terabytes of data, and you need a lot of technical equipment and uh, a lot of administrative work combining um, interests of all of those uh, MNOs. So what would be your recommendation? Um, so where to start? From one MNO uh, with less data and less accuracy, uh, or try to bring all of them um, and, and, and solve everything in, at once? Thank you. Shorena. Thank you so much for the good and very interesting question. Actually, when we are talking about the official statistics, we are producing the data and we must to cover all the population. It means that we need all the existing data to do some good statistics. So, for example, in our country, uh, population uh, geostat statistical office don't have access on the mobile phone data. We have our regulator, ComCom, so ComCom are collecting information and we are processing this data. That's why I mentioned in my presentation that IT infrastructure, IT infrastructure is very crucial factor to start producing the official statistics. So, it is good and it is recommended to have all the data for the statistical purposes because we are producing once again official statistics. If we are the researchers, uh, we must be start with using the small data, just uh, apply, etc., etc. But for the official statistics, as soon as it becomes the official statistics, we must to cover all the population. So it will be guaranteed to have. Uh, uh, have all individuals. Uh, I mentioned that if, for example, person is changing, they are mobile operators, but keep the device, we, can, we will be able to just track these individuals and we don't lose these subscribers. So uh, my recommendation is to use as much as possible. Thank you, Sharena. Thank you. If, if I may, uh, a follow-up question uh, would be um, about how to but this is not. Uh, this is for for all of you. Maybe how to um, add um, uh, data that is not included in mobile uh, operators' data, like small children or people who do not use mobile phones. Um, so maybe you have any insights. I, I guess that you will still need to use some kind of estimation model. So the question is still the same. How much of the raw data we need if we still need estimation model? I think same. Maybe the from the, the <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> from the. from the population side because um, you know when we do a census, then uh, we cover 100% of the population, and uh, we, with the mobile data, it's uh, never a census. Even if you have, if you have uh, one mobile operator's data, it covers. Uh, perhaps 50% of the market, 50% uh, of the people, but uh, there are selectivity issues, uh, representativeness issues. If you have all mobile operators, you're covering more than 100% of the market. So you again have a sample, but the sample is more than 100%. So you always have to have uh, methods to account for that representativeness, whether you use one or, or more. But uh, I think Fabio's points here are very valid that uh, having more operators will give you uh, this assurance to um, 
um, if one operator, for some reason, uh, there's a quality issue or there's an issue of delivering data, then you have the others. And also, um, just to provide a level playing field in official statistics, you have to have, you have to give uh, equal opportunity to all mobile operators to be involved in the project. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. And uh, honestly, you cook what we what you have uh, in a certain country. So if you cannot agree, these are private companies. So if you cannot agree to to get the data exchanged, then, then you, you use whatever is available. And as Sim pointed out, uh, you know, the gross up is, is always depending on you, so depending on the sample you have. So uh, uh, for the uh, other question, I would like to call your attention that Esperanza is online, so she is listening to us now. So if you have any questions about the Information Society handbook, then please go ahead with that too. Yes, please. Oh, no, this is my colleague. If not, then uh, I think uh, we still have a question or we can have uh, a discussion uh, that uh, these books are going to be uh, published and uh, how do we go, go forward in the implementation process? So how do you see that, uh, that we should... Uh, uh, move uh, to the next step and uh, honestly we discussed yesterday this uh, this kind of question because we had a, a small bit with, uh, meeting just between us so uh, so who would uh... Esperanza yeah you would be a good candidate <laughs> so what the next steps would be for our group to to move forward Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, I'm happy that I'm also able to, to join you remotely. Um, and congratulations first to the organizers. I think it's a really great event. So as um, a way forward, I think it's very important specifically uh, for this group, like what the other speakers had mentioned, to continue the discussions in terms of the methodology to proofread it and, and make sure that Indeed, whatever we are including in the handbooks or in the guidelines are as relevant as possible to whatever is happening in the markets. And of course, the scientific community plays a great role and a very important role in ensuring that the methods that we develop at the international level is as um, true or, or as valid as possible. So we rely on, on the scientific community to help us improve the methods that we have. While on the country side or in the, at the national level, there's a need indeed for national coordination. And this is emphasized in every handbooks, in every guidelines that we presented today, that it's important that national coordination is there because data access in this source of data, the mobile phone big data remains a big issue. And it can only be alleviated with um, cooperation from everyone especially the national stakeholders, the regulators and the ministries, and the National Statistics Office to let the, the mobile network operators understand that these data that we are producing are for official statistics, that these are for social good. And this is something that will not be published for commercial purposes. So I think it's important that national coordination to ensure data access is, is done uh, properly is, is a must in this exercise. And of course, um, we always uh, would like to collaborate uh, with the academia and with the scientific community uh, in the implementation of our future activities, uh, as well as in the delivery of, of these um, guidelines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esperanza. And uh, that's, uh, that's quite a good conclusion, I think. So I would like to thank my colleagues for the presentations uh, today and the audience to, to join to this session. And please join me uh, with a, uh, give a big hand to the presenters. Thank you.